Hello everyone, welcome again. We will now look at the business property relief and agricultural property relief. Uh, as I will now share the screen with you so that we can read the notes together. We will do a couple of questions as well in this uh, video. Uh, this is our last video of inheritance tax, except for the trusts. Now trusts is also part of the uh, inheritance tax, but uh, you know, uh, the, uh, that chapter, chapter number 21, which we will do in the next video, that also includes the stamp duty land tax as well. So basically we put that under the inheritance tax section because trust normally deal with the inheritance tax a little bit and not all of them. Uh, so that's why we uh, put it under the inheritance tax, right? Right then, so we will look now look at our business property relief and we'll try to finish our inheritance tax in this video. Uh, if you come to page number, give me one second. Page number 69 of your lecture notes, please. It says business property relief. Now, when you transfer the asset, when you give the asset away uh, for inheritance tax purposes, whatever the value of that asset is, uh, value of that asset can be reduced. So if the value of asset is reduced, uh, tax inheritance tax will also be reduced. So you will have to pay less tax. Uh, so value of asset can be reduced by different ways. One is business property relief, another one is agricultural property relief. So, so there are two different things. Now first we will look at the, what, what the business property relief is. In business property relief, if you have a property which you use for your businesses, so that property will qualify for business property relief. So that value of that property will be reduced uh, if you are using it for the business purposes. Now if you are using it for the business purposes or if a partnership is using it for business purposes and you are is you are partner in that partnership right it is basically exactly the same thing as uh, anyway right uh, there are some shares as well both quoted and unquoted and some securities in them cases as well uh, you know you can reduce the uh, value of the property uh, by using the business property relief uh, as you can see on your screen business property relief can reduce the value of assets by either 100 percent or 50 percent uh, relevant business property is now there are five of them given to you in your notes as you can see first uh, three of them if you look at first first three of them uh, the uh, business property relief is going to be hundred percent on that on first three of them whereas uh, last two of them uh, you will have a business property relief of fifty percent on them if you want to write down you can do so or at the end of this page it is already mentioned to you anyway the business property relief available are percentage reduction in the value of transfer 100% for the assets within para 1 uh, para a b and c uh, and 50% uh, for d and e so what are these first one says property consisting of a business or an interest in business which is a partnership then it says securities of a company you know it is saying securities of a company now when it says securities it is very broad range it does not have only shares. Securities will have debentures. Security will have shares. Security will have gills as well, some bonds as well. So they are a broad range of things. So it is saying security. Security of a company which are unquoted and which give the transfer the control of the company immediately before the transfer and control may be achieved by using related property as well. So it is an unquoted company and the individual has control in it. When considering if he has control or not, we will consider the related property as well. So if her, his wife holds some shares, we will include both of them in order to see if he, ha if he controls or not. Then it says any unquoted shares, it says shares, not securities, any unquoted shares in a company. And so when it says unquoted shares in a company, we don't need to be uh, controlled. We, we don't need any control in that company. We just need to hold some shares in unquoted company, right? Right then, next one after that it says uh, uh, shares or securities which are quoted. Now this time it is saying quoted shares. Uh, shares or securities of a company which, is, uh, which are quoted and uh, which give the transfer control immediately before the transfer. And again it says uh, related property can be used in order to see if he controls or not. And after that it says any land and building and power machinery uh, which was used within the partnership and which give the transfer control before the uh, before the disposal. 
to any land and building and plant machinery which immediately before the transfer for use for the purposes of business carried on by the company of which the transfer had control or partnership of which he was a partner at that time. And after that it says shares or securities on uh, alternative investment markets uh, counted as unquoted. What happened to that? Give me one second, it is page number 16, 69. Right, so shares on securities, uh, shares of securities on the alternative investment market uh, account as unquoted companies. And after that, it says uh, exactly the same thing which I will told you. The uh, first three of them it, it is going to be at the rate of 100% and last two at the rate of 50%. Now, what are the conditions for business property relief uh, on you know, all of them, potential exempt transfer, CLTs, and death estate? So what are the conditions? Let's see. Business property relief is only available if the relevant business property was owned by the transfer for at least two years preceding the transfer. So you must have owned the property for at least two years before the transfer. Uh, or replaced other relevant property so he had held one property for some time then he replaced with another property so replaced other pr property with a combined period of ownership uh, of both of uh, sets of property was at least two years of the last five years so it does not mean that you must hold one property you can hold that property for one year or six months and then you dispose of this one and replace with another one and the combined ownership period must be two years of the last five years. However, if it is one property, then it must be two years. And right then, after that it says uh, BPR, business property relief, is still available uh, even if the transfer cannot fulfill any of the criteria, uh, um, only if the property was acquired, only when if the property was acquired it was eligible for business property relief and the transfer was made, made on death. So what, it, what does it mean is that even if he does not fulfill any of the above mentioned condition, he can still claim business property relief only if when, uh, when the son inherited that property from the dad, uh, when he inherited from the dad, uh, that property was qualified for, in, uh, for business property relief when it was owned by his dad. Right, so Mr. A owned that property and it was qualified for business property relief. Uh, then he died, and that property was transferred to his son as part of death estate. So, in that case as well, uh, you know, business property relief can be claimed. After that, it says a uh, non qualifying business businesses for business property relief. Business property relief won't be available on investment businesses, and that's what it says in, in, the, in the notes as well. Uh, dealing with securities, shares, and stocks dealing in land building and holding investments etc. So if it is uh, investment property you won't get any business property relief because it is business property relief. It's not, it's not investment property relief. <coughs> Excuse me. Next one is uh, agricultural property relief. Uh, you will get 100% of uh, agricultural property relief uh, of the agricultural value of the uh, land <coughs> or the property. <coughs> Excuse me. So agricultural uh, property relief will be at the rate of 100% of the agricultural value of the property. Please remember there are two different things. Agricultural value is something else, market value is something else. All these use the agricultural value of the, of the property and it is going to be at the rate of 100%. So if it is 100%, it will reduce the value at the rate of 100% as well. And 100% of agricultural value, which could be less than market value. Agricultural uh, property relief usually reduce a uh, transfer of agricultural property by 100% of the agricultural value. APR works exactly in the same way like BPR. However, APR will be given preference uh, while calculating these reliefs. So APR will be calculated first, BPR will come later. Conditions for relief uh, applicable for all of them. So for relief to apply, transfer must either own the property and have occupied themselves for the purpose of agricultural property for two years before the transfer and so he must have owned the property and he must have farmed that property as well so they are using it for agricultural purposes so he has owned the property for two years and he's using it for uh, agricultural purposes so he's farming it uh, for two years however in the second case if he does not farm him if he does not want to farm himself he does not want to use it for agricultural purposes himself 
he can let it to someone else. So someone else will be farming it, however he will be the owner. But the period is a little higher than that, a little lengthy. So replaced uh, other relevant property where the combined period of, uh, sorry, uh, owned the property, uh, I'm, I'm reading the B now, I'm sure I'm on the right page. Um, yeah, on the property uh, for at least seven years before the transfer, during which it, m it must have been occupied uh, for the purposes of agricultural by either the transfer or the tenant. So if he's farming himself, it is two years. If he's not farming himself, he's just letting to someone else and he's the owner, someone else is farming on his behalf, then in this case it is going to be seven years, must be seven years out of the last ten years. If the property is replaced with another property, then these conditions must also be satisfied. The transfer had occupied the property for the agricultural purposes for the two years of the last five years. And if it is somebody else who is farming it, uh, then it is going to be for at least seven years of the last uh, ten years in this case. APR is still available even if it does not qualify any of the other conditions in the same way like BPR. So the asset was transferred by a parent. And so when the parent owned that property, when the parent owned that property, he, um, that property qualified for agricultural property relief, uh, but he died, the parent died that time, the dad died. So that property was transferred to the son. Now when it was transferred to the son, it still qualified for APR, but when it was transferred to son, then that son, uh, you know, he said, you know, I won't use it for agricultural purposes. So in that case as well, when the property is uh, transferred as part of the death estate and at, at the time of death it was qualified for APR, uh, then you will get the agriculture property relief even if you yourself does not qualify for APR. Right? So that's it for our uh, this video. Uh, we will now do a question on uh, agriculture property relief and uh, uh, business property relief. So we'll do a couple of questions now. Uh, I will just uh, uh, share the screen again with you so that uh, you can look at our BPP exam kit. Right then, if you could please move to question number 16 of your lecture notes. Uh, sorry, not um, lecture notes, uh, uh, BPP exam kit. Question number 16 of BPP exam kit, it is a past exam paper. A question from the past exam paper, it was examined in uh, June 2012. It's a huge question, so we'll just do part of it. Uh, it is 35 mark question, mm, as you can see here. And whenever you see a question, whether it is a big question like this or it is a small question, first thing always do is to go to the requirements section so that you can know that what it what is required of this question. So then only then uh, you will be able to read the scenario, keeping in mind the requirements. Otherwise, if you just read the, uh, read the question and then go to the requirement, then you, know, you would have forgotten. Uh, you will have to read the scenario again, right? I hope that at this level you should know it. Uh, you've already passed more than 10, 11 papers anyway, right? So, uh, if we read the requirement, it says, uh, <clears throat> he's asking us to make the memorandum uh, requested in the email from your manager uh, for guidance. Uh, there are half marks for calculation, it says, and it is 23 marks, so half marks for calculation means that about 12 marks uh, for, you know, for calculation purposes, 11 and a half. A professional marks will be awarded in part A, and professional marks will also be awarded in part B. Now these are report writing skills, I will tell you uh, the report writing skills uh, in the exam tips video, which will be, you know, available at the end of the session. Uh, and uh, uh, in, in that video, uh, including in that video, uh, I will explain the professional marks as well as other exam tips as well. So how to write a report, how to write a letter, and how to make the memorandum, you know, stuff like that. Uh, as you can see, there are four marks in this question just for the memorandum and letter and presentation skills. These are very, very easy marks and you will get in every exam sitting. Now these marks, which are professional marks, and the marks which are, which are on the ethics, that as a tax advisor, if your client is playing up with the rules, then what should you do? You know, I've uh, explained you in one of the previous videos anyway, what should you, you should do. You should tell them first, if they're not, you know, understanding it, tell them the consequences of it, what can happen, and if they still do, does not agree, and they still keep doing it, 
and then ask them that please disclose this income if, it, if they are hiding say for example if they are hiding a source of income just tell them that please show your source of income if they do not agree ask them that we would do it on your behalf if you let us do that if they still do not agree you know just say them that you know we don't uh, want to work with you anymore just cease acting for them let HMRC know that we do not represent them anymore uh, however you should not uh, you know you're not bound to uh, let HMRC know about the reasons you know HMRC they, they, them guys are not kids anyway they will know the reasons that you know why you stopped working uh, for a client like this right so anyway we, we I, I was just telling you the uh, some easy marks so um, let's read the uh, uh, other part of the question so if you go to the start of the question we'll have to see if, you know other bits and pieces are not much relevant so i'll just start actually i should start from the uh, from here email from our manager uh, i've had a meeting with our client which is you know owner it says uh, another thing as well this question uh, question number is uh, 16 in bpp exam kit if you have any other exam kit, uh, you, know, you can find in your exam kit a uh, question name is O9, it was examined in June 2012. However, please avoid looking at, for this question in the exam kit because, uh, you know, they are different in the exam kit. They are not updated versions. All right. Now, it says, uh, I've had a meeting with uh, Una, a, client, a new client of our firm. Uh, Una was born in 1943 and is a widow. She has a son whose name is Vaughan, who was born in long ago. Uh, and Una is resident and domiciled in the UK. Her taxable income is approximately £90,000. She makes sufficient capital gains to use her annual exempt amount. So she's already, she's already used her annual exempt amount. Now, why is uh, examiner giving us this information in the question? So that whenever you're going to calculate the capital gains tax, there is one portion of capital gains tax in this question as well. So when you're doing the capital gains tax, you don't have to deduct the annual exempt amount because it says he's got enough um, income, so he's already using his annual exempt amount every year. So you don't have to deduct the annual exempt amount. After that, it says uh, Una made a gift of cash of £40,000 to Vaughan, uh, his son, uh, her son, in May 2013, the only transfer she made for the purposes of inheritance tax in the last seven years. Una left the whole of the estate uh, to uh, her son in the will uh, her estate is expected to be worth more than three billion three million sorry and uh, three million pounds at the time of her death for the purpose of this work i want you to assume that uh, she will die on 31st of december 2022 and before we proceed just look at this gift which she made she made a gift of cash of uh, forty thousand pounds so it is a gift for inheritance tax purposes so when it is a gift from one individual to another individual when it is a transfer from one individual to another individual what is it called yeah you're right it is called potentially exempt transfer and you know that there won't be any inheritance tax during our lifetime on pet however if individual dies within the seven years of making the gift then it will be become chargeable for inheritance tax purposes on death if individual survives for seven years after making the gift, there won't be any potential exam, and there won't be any tax on potential exam transfer, neither on death and nor on, uh, you know, lifetime. There won't be any lifetime tax anyway. So this gift was made in May 2013, and it says in the question the assumption has been made that it will die on she will die on uh, 2022. So she has survived uh, for seven years after making the gift. So the gift was made in 2013. She has survived till 20. 2020 i think 2020 yeah 2020 uh, because seven years will end on 2020 so it means that this gift is going to be exempt uh, for inheritance tax purposes right so uh, after that if we just proceed gift to son owner is considering making a gift to one of either small uh, either some farmland situated in england or a residential villa situated in the country of Solorio. Uh, Una has prepared a schedule setting out the details of the farmland and the villa. The schedule is attached to this email. Una will make the gift to Vaughan on his birthday on 18th of November. She is not willing to delay the gift even if it would be advantageous to do so. So it has told us in the question that she is going to gift, a, a gift the villa or the farmlands. She is still thinking which one to gift. But the gift date is defined, uh, you know, it is already 
you know, he has already, she's already told us that she wants to give a gift on her on his birthday uh, on 18th of November 2017. So we know that the gift will be made on this date. Now, whichever it is, even if it is a villa or it is a farmland, it is gift from one individual to another individual. So she will be making gift on 18th of November 2017 and she will die on 2022. So which means that it is potentially exempt transfer, which means that there won't be any lifetime tax. However, there will be death tax because she is going to die within the seven years of making the gift. Right? And another thing is, you have heard about taper relief, haven't you? Now, taper relief will also be available because she has survived for more than three years, right? So uh, she's going to die in 2022, which is between about five to six years. So she's, uh, uh, because she's going to die in 2022, and uh, the gift is made in 18th of November 2017, which means uh, about five to six years she has, been, uh, she has survived. So you'll, you'll have to look at your notes. Uh, on the taper relief table, it will tell you that how much of the percentage is uh, applied for the taper relief for this uh, for this gift, right? All right then. After that, it says a, a tax system in the country of Saloria. Now it has told us that the villa is in the country of Saloria, so she is telling us about the capital gains tax. We don't we're not doing that anyway. And after that, inheritance tax. It says that uh, if she still owns at her death, then the liability will be one hundred seventy thousand pounds. However, if she gives a gift, it will be thirty four thousand pounds. In both cases. Uh, although the liability during a lifetime gift is £34,000, uh, but in both cases she will have to pay the liability on her death. All right? So she's advantageous to do so during the lifetime. So if we want to calculate the you know, net, net effect of the uh, you know, villa, uh, she will have to pay the uh, you know, tax, uh, you know, inheritance tax at, uh, of £107,000 at death. However, if she gives it as a gift, she will have to pay tax at the rate of, uh, you know, at uh, 34,000 pounds. I mean, actual amount of tax liability. So if she gives a gift, it's 34,000 pounds. If she keeps it till death, liability is 170,000 pounds. Which one is better? Yeah, you're right. Giving the gift is better because she'll be paying just 34,000 pounds in tax. If she keeps it till death, it is 170,000 pounds. So if we talk about the villa, she is better off giving it the gift. Net amount of savings, if she gives the gift, will be the difference between £170,000 less £34,000. Right then, after that, uh, a double taxation agreement between the UK and the country of Saloria includes an exem exemption clause whereby assets situated in one country uh, that is party to an agreement are subject to inheritance tax in that country only and not in the other country. I've already incorporated that information into the solution which I told you. However, this says that uh, a double taxation agreement existed between these two countries, UK and the other country. I told you about the double taxation relief. If there is an agreement between UK country and overseas country, if there is an agreement of double taxation relief, if there is an agreement then that uh, tax will only be applicable in the country where the asset existed. So if asset was in, say, for example, France, the tax will be payable in France. When that asset, uh, on, on that specific asset, we don't have to pay UK tax liability, uh, UK inheritance tax. So it will only have, to, we only have to pay tax once in that country, if there is an agreement between UK and France. However, if there isn't any agreement, if there isn't an agreement between UK and France, then what will happen is we will take the value of that asset, even if it is in France, we'll take the value uh, while calculating UK tax, we'll take the value, we'll calculate the tax on that asset in the UK. So if it was £100,000, we'll take the value uh, £100,000. So if the tax rate is, uh, I don't know, 40%, we'll take the 40% of that, that will be our tax liability for UK. So that will be our UK tax liability. But on that same asset, we have to pay tax in France as well. Now, out of that liability, which we have just calculated, which is uh, £40,000, out of that liability, we will have to give the double taxation relief, right? And you know that double taxation relief is lower off UK tax and overseas tax. 